It is really good to see you. If you're visiting with us, we especially are glad you're here, but it's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord today. Let's compose our hearts for worship. I invite you to grab your orders of worship and stand for the responsive call to worship. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you who are almighty and victorious, thy great name we come to praise today. We thank you for the freedom and the ability to gather today to praise you. Help us to always appreciate that wherever we go and with whomever we speak. Help us even now to see your glory, which outside shines this summer sun, which is even dark in comparison, that it hides your light. Let us see with the eyes of faith how bright and shining you are in your glory and in seeing your glory, that we would worship you as we ought. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Our Old Testament lesson today is from Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verses 6 through 14. Hear now God's word. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And if you would now take your order of worship as we come to a time of confession before the Lord. He knows that we are dust and knows that we need confession and invites us to that because of his son. So we'll start with a general prayer of confession to be followed by silent prayers of confession. And together we pray, Gracious, Gracious Lord, have, have mercy upon, upon us. For we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. You are holy and just, and therefore we are unworthy of your favor. But you are also a friend of sinners, who delights to show mercy and abundantly pardon. Forgive us, O Lord. Cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Purify our hearts. Transform our minds. Renew our spirits and grant us everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so high above us and holy and powerful that you do control the things around us in your loving providence. But we thank you so much the more that you are a friend of sinners of whom I am chief. God, thank you that you abundantly pardon because we have abundantly sinned. Oh Lord, I pray that we would never forget your mercy and leave nothing unconfessed. That we think number one is hidden from you, but number two, that you would not forgive for your children as a loving father does their children. Lord, we thank you for this time of confession. We thank you that you remove our sins as far as the east is from the west and let us walk in that freedom and light today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this has been a week of various celebrations. I hope it has for you, not only the 4th of July. Some folks have them on the weekends and things like that. Uh, we went to a college friend of uh, my wife, Emily, and mine, um, and I guess a family friend of hers from even before that. And they always have this 
Fourth of July party the weekend after, and it's their family and some of the neighborhood and us, and I really feel honored to always be there. But an incident happened there between uh, my wife and another guy <clears throat> as we're speaking, and it was totally unintended. And this is one of the reasons I love in that section that we read, there's so much there about as a father loves his children, and he does, all of us generally, but the father loves you specifically and knows what you need and has for a long time. And the incident was this. All during this time, there's Charlie and this other girl, his daughter. And they're kind of that little tier above in age and then a group of younger kids, right? All running around in the water, slip and slide, things like that. And Emily, just out of nowhere, toward the end of the day, just commented, man, you know, Charlie and Pro, which is the girl's name, Charlie and Pro, man, they're just in their own world, aren't they? And sort of smiled and waited for a response. And John, her father, you know, just sort of sat there and kind of just nodded like this. And she kept going on and on about this. I mean, they really have just like stuck together all day and things like this. And John's just sitting there like this. Now, mind you, this girl's about the same age as Charlie. Charlie's nine years old. We're not talking teenage uh, folks running around here. But even then, I saw what was going on. Because she's not used to that. And as a matter of fact, I'm not used to that because that's not my job. You understand? My job, I'm a boy dad for Charlie. My job is mainly to embarrass him every chance I get. <laughs> Emily's job as boy mom is to get used to as a girl uh, being gross now uh, that she has a boy and loving him and really protecting him. However, she's talking to somebody that she's not used to, which is a girl dad. The girl dad job and what he saw at the top of this water slide was, I love him to death, my son Charlie, was this interloper this predator who was speaking to his daughter and they were thinking of marriage and leaving the house and the home <laughs> immediately. That's what he went to. That's what his mind goes to because that's his job as her father is to protect her and to make sure that she is ready one day perhaps for marriage as a wonderful bride and to protect her from anybody who is not worthy of his daughter. In the same way, she didn't know this was going on. She's probably not going to know this was going on behind the scenes, and she won't know or appreciate it until way later. And the same is true for our Father. He knows specifically what we need. And even before we realize it, early in our lives, before we were born and before the foundation of the world, our Father has been preparing a bride to be spotless, to be worthy of the Lamb and of the marriage supper and that consummation forevermore. God is so protective of us and we don't realize it and sometimes may never hear the stories of how many times God has gone before us and prevented the things from happening to really get us on the wrong path and, and leave Christ who is the one who makes us spotless. He has gone before us everywhere. Ezekiel said, I saw you struggling in your blood and I said to you, live and you lived and all through coming of age and into adulthood. This is the wonderful Father who knows specifically His role and does it perfectly. Who sees the bride and says, now she is spotless. And to the point where John can write, and the revelation that Christ gave him, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And when it, were we spotless on our own? No, we know that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The end goal being that marriage supper of the Lamb and joys and pleasures at His right hand forevermore. And so if you believe in Christ, you can know this as you walk through that He has always been there. And if you don't know Him, don't be surprised if even now He is going before you, paving the way, saying, come to me, I easily forgive, and I want you for my family forever. And so if you can say, Jesus is Lord, you can know for a fact that the Father has always loved you.
gave his son for your ransom, and that your sins are forgiven. Let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. And now let us stand and worship the Lord. Thank you. That was such a beautiful job you just did, singing. <laughs> you know, I've, I don't know about you, but I've been to churches where when the, the hymns are sung uh, or the psalms, they, uh, it isn't done very enthusiastically. But, you know, I can hear that you meant what you were singing. Praise God for that. It's great to see you today. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Uh, I'd like to uh, remind you to pass the attendance pads so we can have a record of your attendance, which helps us a great deal. And um, we just are glad that you're here, especially if you're a visitor. Again, we're saying uh, how much we are glad you're here. Let us know if there's any questions or anything that you need that we can help you with. And uh, we, uh, we, are, uh, we are blessed to be here uh, in this country today, uh, worshiping the Lord on this beautiful day. At this time, uh, let the men come to collect the morning offering.
Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we come to thank you as a father who not only cares for us and loves us, but gives us what we need. Lord, thank you for providing for us and for the ability and the spirit to return a portion of that which has been given to us in thanks to you and for the advancement of your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you would bless these gifts. Let them go where they need to. Let them go where is best and let them go safely. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. So we need to rewind a few uh, days ago, actually two weeks ago, when uh, Pastor Jim uh, brought us to chapter 10 of God, John's Gospel. And there uh, we heard the Good Shepherd discourse. Here again, Jesus uh, laid out clearly who he was. Uh, there was no mistaking what he was claiming at that point, uh, as he had already in previous chapters before this, laid out clearly that he was claiming to be divine. He was claiming to be one with the Father. He wasn't just a shepherd. He is the shepherd. He is the door of the sheep. Uh, and uh, clearly the religious leaders hated him for that and wanted to have him killed even in that part of the discourse. So today we move, uh, we're going to move over to chapter 10, verse, beginning with verse 22, reading down to verse four, uh, 42. And there we're going to see, again, the further effects of what Jesus had already said, as well as what uh, he shares with the religious leaders again, and those who were listening to him. But before we get into the text, let's bow together before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the precious word of God. We thank you that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for us. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would work upon our hearts and lives and show us the way. Help us to have greater confidence, assurity, boldness in these dark days to stand fast in what we know is true that Jesus is Lord. Lord, we pray that we might find comfort and peace in the precious promises of the security that we have because of Jesus and who he is and what he did. So work among us this morning, bless our hearts, build us up in the faith, uh, be with our members uh, that are going through extraordinary trials during these days. Bless them and take care of them. We also lift up our missionaries. We lift up uh, Wendy Wilson today, who was in Spain, uh, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. So bless these efforts, Lord. Watch over us and work among us where we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 10, beginning with verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he, 
called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father." Again they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. There's a story that's told about a man who was very concerned about his wife and her ability to hear. And he really wondered if she needed hearing aids, so he went to the doctor, and uh, he asked the doctor, hey, what can I do to see if my wife really does need hearing aids. Well, the doctor said, there's a very simple test you can do. All you have to do is stand about 40 feet away from her and speak in a normal conversational tone and and just see if she can hear you. And if she can't hear you, then just go about 10, 10 feet closer. So and try it again and see if she can hear you. And, and so keep going about 10 paces or 10 feet closer until she can hear you, and that will tell us whether or not she really needs hearing aids or not. So we went home one evening, and he was thinking about this, and wife was in the kitchen fixing their supper, and he is about 40 feet away, and he says, Honey, what's for dinner? And nothing. Absolutely nothing. So he decided to move about 10, uh, 10 feet closer to the kitchen where she was working. And he said, honey, what's for dinner? Nothing. So, okay, he moves 20 feet closer, says that again, nothing. 10 feet closer, right outside the kitchen itself. And she didn't hear, uh, she didn't respond. So he goes up right behind her And he says, honey, what's for dinner? She said, Ralph, for the fifth time, chicken. (laughs) All right. So how's your hearing? How's your hearing today? Because hearing is exactly, exactly right at this moment, as you and I are talking, right at this moment, hearing is more than just getting the sound, right? You can get the sound. Hopefully, the good Lord has preserved your ability to hear well enough that you can hear the sound, but we need to be able to hear at a deeper level than only the sound. We need to be able to hear much deeper than that. And here in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is teaching us Many important points. I'm just going to tell you it's so hard for me uh, <laughs> because to, to communicate once I study, and you know, you study and you learn and you, there's so, so much here. I remember years and years ago, long before I went to seminary, probably in Bible college, hearing uh, that the Gospel of John is like an ocean in a single drop because every single word is so filled with such incredible meaning that is so important and good for us. But here, Jesus is teaching us that His sheep will hear His voice. His sheep will hear His voice. And so, in the context here, it's shortly after He had already addressed the religious leaders. 
And really, this feast of dedication is not found in the Old Testament. It was begun during the intertestamental period between the Old and New Testaments, uh, celebrating <clears throat> the uh, victory over Antiochus Epiphanes uh, by Judas Maccabeus and uh, the resulting uh, temple. And so here they are in, uh, around Solomon's colonnade. We were talking about that in David Lawrence's class this morning. It was very interesting in the book of Acts how that the early church seems to have met in that same area. It's the eastern side of the, the temple area. And, uh, you know, it, doesn't, it isn't really there anymore in the, in the way it was during that time. But it was a beautiful area. Here he was. And, uh, you know, he's there. He, he, the, the religious leaders were already inflamed with what he had already said, where he clearly claimed to be more than man. He had claimed to be divine using the very name of God over and over again in an exclusive way uh, to say that he, you know, what he says here in this text, he's already said many times and they heard it because that is exactly why they wanted to have him killed. That's why they picked up stones before and that's why they attempted to arrest him before this in the Gospel of John because they did not have any problem understanding exactly, precisely, who Jesus was, was uh, claiming to be. And so um, they had heard those claims and already had made decisions to have him killed. So when these Jews come to him to ask him these questions, we have every reason to believe that it wasn't a sincere seeking after him. They were trying to find a basis, a clear basis to have him killed. So first, in the text, we see this. We see the incredible clarity of inexcusable ignorance that's rooted in pure depravity. Inexcusable ignorance rooted in pure depravity. That is a pretty succinct way of saying this. And look at what they say. Tell us plainly. In other words, they're saying to Jesus, hey Jesus, you're being too evasive. You're being too ambiguous. You're, you're not putting it out there plainly for us so that we can understand it. Uh, stop doing this uh, evasive, ambiguous, trying to find ways to say things uh, that you, you know no one can really understand. Well, how ridiculous. They clearly understood it because they, they sought to kill him. They sought to seize him. And the reason that they did is because they knew very well that he had claimed to be divine and there was no, no uh, lack of clarity there. Uh, R.C. Sproul talks about how this reminds him of Luther before the Diet of Worms when they called him there and laid out his writings in front of him and said, recant, recant your writings. Well, Luther said, which one of my writings? Not everything that's laid out here, not everything that I've written over the course of my life is heresy. I can't possibly give you an answer, uh, a blanket answer, because most of these writings are good. Even in your eyes, they're good. And they charged him with answering the charge and not to do so literally in the Latin with horns. That means with a deceptive evasiveness, with studied ambiguity, trying to uh, muddy the water and live in the fog. So we live in a time when many pastors, yeah, it's true, many so-called pastors do that, okay? 
Yeah, I remember as a young man, <laughs> again, I'm, I'm in Bible college today, <laughs> which has been a couple of years ago, interviewing a, a pastor that was in a very liberal church. We were called upon in a course that I took that we had to go out and interview a pastor, so we did. And, and myself and another good friend of mine sat down with this pastor and had questions for him, and we talked about the feeding of the 5,000. And, and we were asking the pastor questions about the feeding of the 5,000. And it sounded really uh, a little bit strange what he was saying, but not, not really strange, but a little bit strange. And so I asked him this simple question. Did, it, did the people at Jesus, at the feeding of the 5,000, did they actually get anything to eat? Did those people actually eat anything like bread and fish? And he said, well, no, probably not. But it took asking a question like that to reveal the fact that he was talking about this on a totally different plain and having totally different assumptions about what that passage was about. He was spiritualizing it and making it sound as if, well, you know, Jesus satisfies our needs. Well, yes, but we're not just talking about Jesus satisfying our needs. In the text, it says they ate. And what are you doing with that? Well, he had redefined it all to mean something else. And so this is the kind of thing that they're charging Jesus with here in this text. Tell us plainly. The fact is, he had already told them so plainly that they couldn't tolerate it. And I would just pause here and say that that is exactly what unbelief, unbelievers and those uh, that have it or can't come to faith in Jesus will say. They'll say, well, I can't really tell. I can't really understand. There's not enough here for me to understand. There's not enough factual data for me to understand what to believe about Jesus. And we can see that, you know, we could talk about that a long time. As a tw at the beginning of the 20th century, Albert Schweitzer and his quest for the historical Jesus. You know, he comes to the conclusion that we can't even know if Jesus was a real person or if anything that we have about Jesus in the gospel is true. And in our own days, we have the Jesus Seminar where people, uh, where scholars, quote unquote, literally come together and take a vote on the gospels to see, is this real or is this just mythology that got put in there? And so the unbeliever wants to say that it's not clear enough. My friends, it is clear enough. It is so clear you cannot miss it. It's just that it's so clear that many people can't tolerate it. They don't like it because in the depravity, in the fallenness of our human nature, we, we don't want to see how perilous our condition is. We don't want to admit how much we must have a Savior. We must be saved. We do not want to be dependent on God or anyone else uh, for justification. But it comes down to verses 10, uh, excuse me, verses 30 and 31, where Jesus says, if you didn't think this was not clear enough, is this clear enough? I and the Father are one. Is that clear? Okay, that's, that, is that clear enough for you? That is a succinct statement that couldn't be more clear. And you notice that they got it because they start picking up the rocks. And that's, you know, that's what the world will do. It's the offense of that. You see, and I've said that a few weeks ago when I had the privilege of speaking on uh, Jesus when he says, I am the light of the world. It's so 
difficult for the world to deal with the fact, and this is so important. Please, please get this if you don't get anything else. Get this, okay? Get this. Jesus is the one, the only one. And that is what he said. That's not just what I say. That is exactly, repetitively, over and over again, he says this. And people can take Jesus as long as they don't have to see him as the one, the only one, the only one. And Jesus has said it over and over and over again here, and now he's saying it again, and they cannot stand it. They literally cannot stand it. So history shows us the reluctance to, for people to accept that Jesus is one with the Father, that Jesus and the Father are one. Arius, who was an early church heretic in, in the fourth century, wanted to say that, that Jesus was like the Father, but not equal in power and glory with the Father. And when he came to a, this passage, he said, I and the Father, this passage where Jesus just says, I and the Father are one. Um, he says, one in mission, one in aim, but not one in substance. That does not make a bit of sense. And if you look at the text, and you see here, Jesus elaborates further in the text, that the Father is in him, and he is in the Father. He's talking about subsistence. He's talking about substance, one in essence. And so it wasn't because he had done good works. It wasn't because of his miracles that they hated him. It wasn't because, it, you know, they had trouble with his teaching. They didn't like his teaching. But it really wasn't ultimately about his teaching as a rabbi. It wasn't about anything except that point right there. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Christian, do not fudge on that. <laughs> We live in a culture that wants you to fudge on that and wants you to spin that and will spin that. That is not biblical Christianity. That is not what Jesus... Jesus claimed to be one with the Father. And that is very vitally important because if he's not one with the Father, then all that he promises and all that he did would be, would be ineffective, would be nothing. He is the one. He is the one and only. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except by me. Second, the practical consequences of Jesus being the good shepherd of the sheep. We see that beginning with verse 26, for instance. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So what a promise. <laughs> what a blessed promise. You see, it's eternal life. Do you get that? Think about that. Eternal life. This isn't life. This is more than life. This is eternal life. That means life that will never end. Life that goes on forever. That's what he says. And since it is life that goes on forever, it will never end. It will never end. And I'm telling you, <laughs> that's good news. If you can't get excited about that, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, this is good. Is this good? This is good. 
This is the promise of the, this is Jesus. This isn't, this isn't me. This isn't a church doctrine. This isn't historical something. These are the words of Jesus Christ to you. And he says that your eternal life in him is secure forever and ever. And you know what? Without the first thing that I said, what I'm saying now about the security makes no sense. It's only because Jesus is the one. It's only because Jesus is divine. It's only because I, Jesus being able to truthfully say, I and the Father are one. It's only on that basis that you should totally and completely and wholly with all of your heart trust what he says here. Because if Jesus is just a good moral teacher, then perhaps he could be wrong about this. But he's not. He's very God of very God. And he's saying to you and to me that my sheep hear my voice. In other words, they hear it differently than people who can just hear the sound of it. In the depths of their being, it resonates in the core of their being. We just got through reading the Scripture. And we always say that all flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field and the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God endures forever. This is the Word of our God. My sheep hear my voice. Jesus says that hearing Him is on a different level for those that know Him by faith. Many people hear Him, but they don't believe Him. And here is an example. They heard Him. Right in front of them was the Son of the living God. Right in front of them was the one who had done amazing miracles in front of them. And yet they did not get it. They would not hear it. And so faith is a gift of God. It's, it's, it's evidence um, of, of the fact that, that we know God, that God has worked a work of grace on our heart. So what is he saying here? He's saying that, that sheep hear and you know they believe and they follow and there's unending life that God has a hold on His people and He will never let them go. He will never let you go. Never. Ever. Forever. In eternity. He will never let you go. Jesus said in John 6.37, All that the Father give to me shall come to me. You see, there's the hearing. Sheep hear. And the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. And this is the will of him that sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but will raise it up on the last day. So, you know, <laughs> what could be better than this? This is wonderful. My salvation doesn't depend on me continuously being on how faithful I am, ultimately, right? I'm called to be faithful, yeah. But God has got a hold on us. If we know Jesus Christ by faith, if we know Him, then He's not going to let us go. This week, Jim and I went to see a precious church member to take them communion. And most of you probably know who I'm talking about. They're in hospice clear-headed, let me just tell you, clear-headed, this person is clear-headed about passing away. No fear. I'm saying no fear. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying, I don't know, I can't look in their heart. I'm just telling you, I see no evidence. I'm a guy who makes a living listening to people and trying to see what people are really about. No fear. Where did that come from? 
It comes from the bedrock confidence that the Lord Jesus Christ is a savior of sinners. He saves us. He doesn't just make possible salvation. He saves his sheep and he gives them eternal life and nothing or no one can snatch them out of his hand. This is the greatest thing. (laughs) The soul that on Jesus is leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. It is the greatest thing. It's not that you have a hold on Christ. It's that Christ has a hold on you and he will never let you go. The last thing here that I want to say is how Jesus deals with further objections here, but he's talking about the infallibility of Scripture. I can't pass over that. Um, Look at what he says here in verse 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are God's, If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? There's so much in that, it can't be said. But notice how Jesus deals with the scriptures. Do you think if you're a follower of Jesus, you should deal with the Scriptures the way Jesus deals with the Scriptures? Yeah, I think so. Jesus bases his whole argument there on one single word out of the Old Testament. One single word out of the Old Testament. What does that tell us about Jesus and how he saw Scripture? He saw it as the Word of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Notice this too, and the Scriptures cannot be broken. There's too much there to unpack right now, but it's clear that in the view of Jesus that the Bible is organically tied together in such a way that it it is consistent with itself and you can't, you can't break it. It's all true. All of it. This tells us how Jesus dealt with the Scriptures. So our critics want to say to us, you guys are just too biblical. You know? you're, too, you're too conservative. What's wrong with you? Do they not see this in the Scripture? Do they not see how Jesus te- dealt with the Scriptures himself? Do they not see... His high view of the inspiration, infallibility, authority of Scripture, the effectiveness of Scripture. Of course, Jesus did. He saw the Bible as the infallible Word of God. And do you think He just didn't know better? Do you think He was just a product of His time and bless His heart, He just didn't know better? Oh, how wrong you would be. He knew exactly what he was saying when he said this. So hearing his voice in the scriptures is what we should do if we're his sheep. We should love the scriptures. I I can't wait for the day when I hear the voice of Jesus with these old ears. (laughs) Yeah, you see that ear right there? That old ear right there. Resurrected one day. And this old ear right here is going to hear the voice of the Son of God. But you know what? He's speaking today through the Scriptures. And if you love Him, and how can you not love Him? How can you not love a Savior like this? What do you want? This is the Savior. This is the only one. There isn't another one. We should love the Scriptures because we hear the voice of Jesus And we should draw close to it. So how is your hearing today? Only Jesus' sheep truly hear His voice. Do you hear Him calling you today? Do you hear Him telling you today what you should do, what you should believe? Are you trusting in His promises today? Are you living to His glory today? 
Are you sinking into this culture that says maybe Jesus has something to say, but, you know, we can't tolerate someone who claims to be God. He claimed to be God. Let the world go its way. Let's go the way that Jesus called us to go. May we pray. Father, thank you for your precious word. Bless it to the hearts of your people. Strengthen us. Let us hear you speaking to us in the scriptures. Father, help us to turn to Jesus as the only Savior, the only Lord. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. There's only one way to be saved. There's not many ways to be saved. There's only one way to be saved. And that one way is the broken body and shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave his body to be broken. He knew he would be rejected when he went to Jerusalem on that last Passion Week. He knew. But he loved us and he gave himself for us. And forever and ever, we'll never get over that. Ever. And here we are uh, with the Lord's Supper before us, drawing us to once again remember where our salvation is vested and who it is that saves us. The Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper, after having given thanks, and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink all of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, having seen this Jesus, the one, and haven't tasted his flesh and drunk his blood, I pray you would empower us throughout the week and empower us through our entire lives until we drink with him again in heaven. Lord, I pray that we would remember the sacrifice that you had made to where his body would be broken on the tree and his blood shed, the only blood that matters, the perfect blood of your son, so that one day no more blood would be shed. And Lord, I pray for the peace of Christ in our hearts and in the world because of that perfect blood. Give us the eyes of faith and the inclination to see that when we run up on anything that would shake our faith in the one. Lord, I pray that we would remember in gratitude all of the things that you give us that are gifts through him, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. And now let us stand and sing the first and last verses of hymn number 508. Let us receive the Lord's blessing together. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people said,